So in the past few years, many major political figures around the world have proclaimed the death of the multicultural ideal. And with its demise, multiculturalism as a political doctrine have come under very, very heavy scrutiny. It has emerged as a criminal, as a sinful vagabond that we can blame and hold accountable for a range of social evils. From littering or antisocial behavior to social isolation, segregation, political disengagement, lack of trust. Let me give you a bit of a feel of what these politicians have said. So to take, for example, the British Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron. David Cameron has said that under the doctrine of state multiculturalism, <coughs> different communities have been encouraged to live separate lives apart from one another and apart from the mainstream. Moreover, he implies that when different communities are leading these separate uh, lives, some of them would form values that would run contrary to the values of the mainstream society. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel has said something very similar as well. So this idea that we can live side by side and live happily with each other is problematic. It is not what is happening in practice. She says it failed. It utterly failed. Unequivocally, these messages are very negative. And what they're saying to us is that we have a corpse on our hands and it is rottening, it is gone putrid, it is smelling so bad that half of the politicians around the world feel that something, the moment has, some, has come for something to be done about it. And immediate action has to be taken. However, if we are to identify the body in the morgue of political ideals, and let's face it, in our history of humankind, we've gathered quite a few political ideals out there. In order to be able to say if there are particular principles that are unsavory and run against the values of our societies, we'll have to be able to answer the question of what multiculturalism really is. So we we'll need to know what are its component features. So we need to walk into really some fundamental questions. Again, what multiculturalism is, how did it come about, and what are its characteristic features? First one. Multiculturalism is an umbrella term. It covers the moral and political claims of different disadvantaged groups. And these could be from African Americans in the United States. We could be talking about women in general. We could be talking about different um, uh, people with disabilities, for example, about gays and lesbians. But this is not how most politicians and theoreticians use the term. So when they use the term multiculturalism, they really mean the claims of different immigrants and minority groups in the major receiving societies around the world. These could be different religious minorities, such as, for example, all Muslim people in Western Europe. We could be talking about ethnic minorities, Latinos in the US. We could be talking about minority nations, the Welsh, the Quebecois, the people in the Basque um, country. We could be talking about indigenous people, <coughs> So we could be talking about Maori, New Zealand, or peoples in the United States. Until the 1950s and the 1960s, most Western states explicitly discriminated against these minority groups on different religious and racial characteristics. These groups would actually be denied the right to immigrate or the right to citizenship. They would be denied fair access to, you name it, public housing, public education, 
or employment. After the horrors of the Second World War, and especially during the civil rights era in the United States, our society has said enough is enough. We are going to try to do something about it. We really would move towards a more egalitarian forms of connection and we'll really try to um, really make fundamental different freedoms. And they did that by establishing non-discriminatory legislation. A lot of people are saying, well, non-discriminatory legislation directly benefits minority communities. Therefore, this is what multiculturalism is. No. Non-discriminatory legislation is part of this idea of fundamental liberal values and freedoms. It is the founding stone of the liberal doctrine. And we should really not be conflating these two different regimes. So how is multiculturalism different from the liberal doctrine? Well, under multiculturalism, you need to look at the law, really examine it, and perhaps change and adapt it so that it directly reflects different cultural practices of different groups. And in my research, this is what I really do. Unlike many other scholars that work into multicultural policies around the world and how they have been adopted, I look at the multicultural ideal and I look at what has been done in practice and I see, okay, are there particular aspects that actually have not been adopted? I look into one particular country and my research focuses almost exclusively on the United, K uh, on the United Kingdom and this is the case that <coughs> I'm going to show to you today. So I really, if we are suspecting that multiculturalism has run amok, it's, you know, this criminal out there on the rules, well, we need to be able to say why, what kind of aspects of criminal behavior are there and how can we substitute them, to borrow another term from David Cameron, with more muscular liberalism. So we really need to look into uh, the detail. And we can really think about the founding pillars of multiculturalism. This could be grouped into four major categories. So we can think about them as exemptions, um, assistance, we can think about ethnic quotas, and the recognition of foreign legal quotes. Now, in terms of exemptions and assistance, we really do see some evidence that steps have been taken in order to really establish these multicultural principles. However, in terms of um, the other two, the ethnic quotas and the adoption of foreign legal quotes, I will say that there has been a lot more smoke than there has been fire. To start with the first one, to start with exemption. Well, in uh, the UK, for sick men, they are allowed to actually wear a turban uh, on a motorcycle instead of a helmet. Uh, sick policemen could also choose to wear a turban <coughs> rather than wear a protective helmet. So there has been really made an exemption in the world to uh, recognize the cultural practice of a particular group. Some might say, well, you know, these people are just tokens, they're not really pioneers because no similar steps have been taken about other groups, but we'll leave that for the time being and we'll say, okay, there is some evidence of multiculturalism. In terms of assistance, we know uh, something uh, that a lot of scholars call the Samosa Revolution has taken place. Local authorities, love to organize different food and cultural events and really seems that food is what is going to guarantee the multicultural um, acceptance um, of this broader ideal. However, if we look at faith schools, for example, another principle applies. And this is the principle of perfect symmetry. So it's not that you have specific funding to Muslim schools, but you also have funding for Protestant and Catholic schools. And the idea of perfect symmetry is very much part of the liberal regime rather than of multiculturalism. And I still think the two should not be uh, conflated. What about if we work into ethnic quotas and foreign legal quotas? 
Well, in mainland UK, there are no ethnic quotas. So we do monitor the ethnic composition of the workforce, but this is still part of the enforcement of this non-discriminatory legislation. There are some uh, religious quotas in Northern Ireland for Catholic and Protestants, but in mainland, we were, when in, in mainland UK, we really cannot talk about ethnic quotas. What about uh, the adoption of foreign legal codes? Well, if you look at the spread of the Daily Mail and if you look at the headline, so many times you come across this headline, Sharia courts are taking over Britain and over our legal system. Well, this is not true. Sharia courts can still not dissolve a civil marriage. They can dissolve a religious marriage and perhaps for practicing Muslim, this is important, but only British courts have jurisdiction over civil marriages. So, as I said, a lot of small here, but little fire. And then if we move towards this negative outcome, so remember I've told you in the beginning that politicians are very worried that multiculturalism has allowed for um, mistrust and social isolation to propagate and general political disaffection. So what do we find about that? Well, if we look into lack of trust and lack of general sociability, such as unwillingness to help neighbors, they're much more dependent on economic cleavages at the neighborhood level. They're not really dependent that much on the diversity in um, different neighborhoods. Moreover, if you look into voting behavior and if you look into um, uh, true interest in politics, minorities that are living uh, amongst a lot of others of their own kind are not necessarily less dis and more disengaged with British politics. They don't seem to be affected in, in that sort of way. There is one variable, though, for which there is a lot of fire, and that's identity. And whereas for the others, there are a lot of different claims could be made for identity, no matter whether we have the citizenship survey, whether we have the British social attitudes or understanding society, we do find the second generation people are really strongly identifying with Britain. Especially British Muslims and British Asians are really very much embracing this identity. And if, in fact, this result, which is a concrete result, and it runs contrary to the message from the political establishment, we do have a problem. About two years ago, I saw a fantastic play. It's called Snookered. And it was about a group of these Asian boys that were um, gathered, uh, gathering in a bar and they were playing snooker. And they were saying like how much they really hated to be called, oh, you know, you the Asian boy or you the Paki boy out there. And especially one of them resented it so strongly because not only he, but his parents were also born in Britain. And to have your identity questioned and suspected on a <coughs> daily basis is really problematic. Politicians are very interested in macro effects, such as terrorism, they're interested in what causes ethnic conflict and unrest. And if they're continuing to suspect different minority groups that they're engaging with a superordinate form of identity, in fact, they would marginalize them and that could have very grave consequences in terms of political and general social disaffection. So, I need to tell you that in this talk, I really have tried to convince you that we should um, basically engage and inspect the multicultural ideal and multiculturalism as two separate entities. The multicultural ideal rests on the idea that by celebrating our uniqueness, we are going to see how much we have in common. That we have so much more in common than what differentiates us. And I think what has happened and what um, is really that is the belief in our politicians that we can evolve into societies, 
in which minorities are no longer going to be the religious or the ethnic other. And that is sad, because these politicians are the leaders of our communities and our countries. But I also have some good news. I don't think that we need an alien invasion to come and to convince us, okay, we have a lot in common. I think that in our daily lives, we constantly embrace common activities, common interests. And that brings us together. In fact, you're all here for a TEDx talk. And that allows an opportunity for us to constantly exchange ideas and to experience both the common and the unique. We are all unique, but we are all human. And that's something to celebrate and to cherish. Thank you.